As you watch my life story, how I grew up in the jungles of South America, I hope this story will encourage you to praise the Lord with the gift God has given to you. I hope this story also will encourage you to love the Lord with all your heart. I hope that you will see that God is great. He gave me the chance from a little mud house to the modern stage. Because people supported mission work, my life has been changed and that's what I want to share, how God and how good God is to all of us. Now we're going to hear from Edward Clausen, and he plays this most unique instrument, a uh, Paraguayan harp. You're going to enjoy this. Welcome with me, Edward Clausen, as he plays Arrival. Edward enjoyed that. Boy, those fingers really must get a good workout when you uh, play. Yes, uh, I have to uh, keep my fingers quite in shape, that, <laughs> and the most actually my fingernails. And I'm sure you do. You've played over 2,000 concerts, standing yeah. up. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You don't yes. get to sit down. Like a lot of people that play a harp that I'm used to seeing, sit down, and it's, a, it's sort of a wide harp where they really have to reach out there. Now, you have long arms, so you could probably play one of those too, but, but this is very different. This is a Paraguayan harp, I understand. And uh, let me see. Tell me where the sound comes out of here. I see a microphone here, but where does the sound really come from? Well, actually, the, the sound is coming from the front and from the back and from the holes. I have two holes, one on the back on the and back, one on yeah. the bottom. And uh, the harp is made from cedar, from Paraguayan wood. Really? And uh, the early missionaries brought this harp into South America in late 1500s and early 1600s with their European harps. And somewhere down the road, they run out with this kind of uh, harp that so they brought along. Mm -hmm. So they had to build a new one. And that's actually what came out in 350 years. Not this one, but the, quite the same style, you know. Well, that's really something. Now, I notice there's different color strings there. What does that mean? I've often wondered. I've seen harps, and there's red strings, blue ones. Now, what do those strings mean? Well, actually, the red and the blue strings are my guidance that I know where I am, that I have to, if I go for a different key, that I know where I have to uh, jump at. And that's actually about it. 
It could be all the same color too. Is it sort of like playing a piano? However, you don't press keys, you pluck strings. Is that sort of uh, the idea of playing a harp? Well, yes. I played this harp with four fingers on the left hand side and four with the right hand side. And uh, that is actually a little bit different, yes. I have just one key in once. If I want to play a different key, I have to tune the harp into a different key. Very interesting. Now, your last name is Clausen. Yes. And you've been raised in Paraguay. Now, those, Clausen is a German name, isn't it? And uh, how did uh, a Clausen end up in Paraguay? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, actually, they came from Germany to Russia and, and in 1874 to Canada from Russia, settled in Manitoba in 1927 to South America. And they were actually the first German settlement in the whole South America. And uh, I came back in 19... 86, with no English to this beautiful country, Canada, actually, as a grandchild. Well, you're doing excellent. You're speaking wonderful English. We're just understanding you. So you speak Spanish and German. That's right. Yes. Why don't you even take 15 seconds here and say a little something for the Spanish folk who may be watching right this uh, moment. Maybe a greeting, maybe a, something from your heart that you want to uh, tell the Spanish folk here in Canada that are watching today. Ustedes, uh, que hablan español aquí en Canadá, uh, yo soy Eduardo Clasen, yo nací en Paraguay, en un país español, y um, ojalá que le guste el programa con el arpa paraguayo. Well, your wife, Christine, newlywed wife, is going to be joining you on this next song, and I'm going to ask her to just come on in and sit down at the piano there, and if we can get a shot of her, it's, uh, she's a Canadian, and uh, it's wonderful to have a, uh, someone, uh, a team, Paraguayan, German, Canadian, I guess you're Paraguayan uh, slash German slash Canadian. You're, you're sort of all of those, but you've <laughs> yes. married a Canadian. It's good to have you re residing here in Canada and uh, newlywed just how many months? Well, we got married uh, August 28 last year and uh, just a little bit over five months. And uh, Christine is playing the background for, with the synthesizer. And Christine is also a uh, registered nurse at the Stratford Hospital. Great. Well, Christine, it's good to have you here with us as well. Tell me about this next song that you're going to play. The next song is uh, Nihar My God to Thee. That's a song from the Titanic, actually, what, when it became a little bit more uh, knowing. Uh, that were, uh, the people did sing it when the Titanic went down in the ocean. Mm. Uh, what a testimony. Nihar yes. My God to Thee. Yes. They sang it, you said. As they did sing it, yes. Boy. Well, God bless you as you play this uh, next number. I'm sure we're going to thoroughly enjoy it. And it's wonderful to have you with us, and we're looking forward to more good music all through this program. Let's welcome, once again, Edward Clausen. Thank you.
Last year, we as a family, we went to Paraguay, South America. We took the plane from Toronto all the way to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and from there we took another plane straight to Asuncion, Paraguay. And there my brother picked us up with the car straight through the jungle. So this is the wilderness. As far as you can think, there are no more cities here. This is all jungle, as far as you can think. The rule as a cowboy is the rule here. Whoever has the biggest gun. 500 kilometers of pavement road, just awesome. For the first time in my life, I saw a pavement highway in my hometown where I was born and raised. Okay, here's Loma Plata downtown. Pavement road, right driving through the center of the biggest city in the Paraguayan Chaco. That was just beyond words to see that. What a change since I left the jungle many moons ago. My mom's yard here. That's my mom's house at the moment. We are here for a family reunion. And if you look up there, that's my mom's water tank. From there she has water through the whole house. It's just gravity, the water goes by gravity. It goes all the way to the house, she has washrooms in there. You wouldn't believe it, that house looks quite nice inside. She has air condition, just about all of her rooms. This is a very small bottle tree. You can see it here, this is, this is one of my favorite trees in Paraguay, in Chaco. It has beautiful leaves, and it is just wonderful to sit in the shade of one of those trees. So just, uh, this is a little baby one, it's very small, maybe it's, it's about eight years old maybe. They get up to two, three meters thick, maybe even close to four meters thick in some areas. Well, here we have our second big rain in the Chaco. You see this is early morning, the rain is just coming down from heaven. It was 40, seven Celsius for quite a few days. Now having a rain like this, you wouldn't believe it. It's just like walking into a fridge. Finally, it's nice and cool here. The roads are all mud. Believe it or not, I mean, that must be really something. I'm glad I'm not living here anymore. It's really a hard life, really hard to live here. Only those people who live here can actually imagine what it means. The trees must be singing their praises because of the water they are getting. Finally, that they can drink some water. It hasn't really rained a good big, big rain for 12 years here. So I can just imagine. And this is not a big rain either. I mean, this is just a small little rain compared for that was what it used to be here years ago. I remember it was a lot more. That uh, papagai up there, the parrot, they are native here. They are, there are many of them. Many, many, many of them out there. See, he's just waiting there or seeing the rain and enjoying it. It's my mom's papagai. My mom and, and my wife Christine are sitting there. They have a mate here. See, there, there they are sitting, and this is how they do it. Yeah, my mom has that, that yerba thing. My, my wife Christine is drinking the yerba. See there? They're drinking a hot tea in the morning. I'll give it back to my mom here, you see, and then she filled it up. 
and then uh, and then uh, she is drinking. If he will drink that easy going out. That is the chocolate lizard. I couldn't believe how loud it was in the jungle. Yeah, people always think that the jungle is a quiet place that people can just go and relax. It is a nice place, but it's loud. I had a great time with my family, my buddies, my friends I grew up with. And not just that, we went to the native mission field. So this is the native mission field, one of them. It's uh, organized by the, by the Mennonites, I guess. These are the Indians, the Lengua Indians, they call them. And uh, there's one with a bike. She has a nice bike. See, they're working for the Mennonites here, so they have good money. Although still money, but they still live in a, like in a shed like that out there. It's, it's just amazing. Typical house where the native live. He has a cistern to catch the water from the rain. And there's an outhouse on the right. This is how they live. No grass, nothing. Just very simple. Look at they have a stereo, they have television. See, right there. Beautiful. Everything what you need here. <laughs> These two have two different soccer teams here. One of them is Olympia, one of them is Cerro. That's just amazing. They talked to me from the back and asked me if it would be on the film. This is the high school from the native mission field. Obviously nobody's in school right now because it's summer holiday here. This is their big high school and there are lots of students from the native people who go to high school. I mean that is just absolutely incredible just to think about that they go to high school. Look at how big church they have here. And not just the church. They have high-speed internet here among the natives. Internet, the natives, never mind us, the native too. Can you believe that? Look at the big church, beautiful made. It's for sure packed full on a Sunday here. To play soccer, they know. This guy here worked together with me many years at the native mission field. Um, he even remembered my nickname, which was the Eagle. <laughs> yeah, you Nick, and then Carancho. And uh, uh, he told me always the name, so he's living here now and working here. As soon as he saw me, incredible, he remembered me right away. Che, ¿cuánto año tenés? 41. 41. He's 41 years old and I'm 50, so he was nine, nine years younger than me. So he worked with me in the brick factory, and we always had a good time. I still remember him, that was always good, and now I'm telling him stories how I have seen Canada. These people just arrived from, from the bus, from the city, from working. You just see, well, from the city, from the main town in La Plata. Um, this is a guy who speaks everything a low German. You wouldn't believe it. He's a native people grew up here. He can speak all the low German the same as me. He grew up in one of the Mennonite homes and he says hi to all the people in Canada and he wants to tell them that he is still alive and doing very well. Yeah, we came many years ago and this native people, they lived with us here all those years and uh, he is just showing the paper what he, have, what he has right there, a reunion, 2011. Yeah, I still have a bit of angel truck side events. That's an feeling meant for the canon of teach, ne? I mucho que que no habla alemán en Canadá, así que le meto un poco en inglés. This is a retirement home for the natives. It looks like they just built that, so the native people can retire here and live here for a house. They have their own service here. I think that's that's a very good idea that the native people have their own retirement home.
I remember when we first met, I really enjoyed listening to the stories of how your ancestors came from Canada and from Russia, even further back. I'd love to hear that story again. Yeah, um, my ancestors moved away from, from, from Europe, obviously. They came to Canada in 1874. They settled in the prairies um, around Winnipeg, uh, Winkler, Steinberg area. They lived there for about 50 years. In 1927, 1,600 conservative Mennonites packed their boxes and moved away from the modern civilization. They took the train from Manitoba to New York City. Here, they took a big ship all the way south to Buenos Aires, Argentina. And there, they had to take a smaller boat up the Paraguayan River. I don't know exactly how many kilometers, but maybe 1,600, 1,500 kilometers northwest, deep into the South American continent. And then one day, I guess they came uh, to the area where they had to get off the boat, and from there they had to walk. 500 kilometers away from the nearest city was their future home. From the river to the jungle where they're supposed to settle, there, were no, there was no road, there was nothing. Swamps, palm trees, billions of mosquitoes and thousands of crocodiles, and you name it, wild animals. They bought themselves uh, from the Spanish people oxen wagons, machetes and spade and axe, and slowly heading for their new home. It was absolutely horrible, that whole trip. You see, they didn't know where to go. It was just hacking themselves through the wilderness. Many, many days, many, many weeks, I think the whole thing took till they finally made it to their destination. Before the first year of settlement was gone, 126 people had died, including my great grandma. She died on typhus fever before they had settled in the jungle. There were seven wild Indian tribes who lived in that area. Those were native people who were always on the move. They had no house. They could only have one child. If they had more than one child, they killed it. So here they settled, learned their language, and learn how to live with them. Today, my colony has about 9,000 people, 87 towns. We have 25,000 native people living around a colony. Today, those native people have nice homes, they have schools, churches, they are, they are, they are getting educated, they do so well. Actually, the first native person became a doctor in medicine. I think that's just absolutely amazing. Today when I look back, I think my ancestors settled in that jungle that those native people today can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they can love the Lord, serve Him with the gift God has given to them, and also that they could settle. Today they have nice families, including my people. They have been changed so much. There are no words to describe it how much they have been changed, and today that we can bring the gospel to those who never heard it before. I thank God for the privilege I had to be born and raised in Paraguay, South America. Now I know many of you, the, the, the listeners might not know where Paraguay is. Paraguay is in South America. It's a Spanish-speaking country. My ancestors, my great-grandparents moved away from Canada in 1927 to isolate themselves from the modern civilization they couldn't have found a better place than the Paraguayan bush. Oh, 500 miles from the nearest city. Yeah, uh, actually just about 500 kilometers away from the nearest city. My great-grandparents settled in a, wil in a wilderness. They had no, never um, white people have lived before in that area. When, when my great-grandparents came to that area, they faced many different uh, native tribes. They learned their language and learned how to live with them. In that jungle, my mom and dad were born and raised, and so were my five brothers and I. This is early morning here in a Paraguayan Chaco. This is the best place a day. It's just very nice uh, temperature, maybe 25 Celsius. The sun is just up. Tell me about farm life in Paraguay. It must have been really interesting. Yes, when we were little, I mean, my mom and dad had a few cows. That was about it. My dad was a blacksmith. He made buggies, 
and uh, we helped them sometimes after school, we had to work with that. But also, um, it has developed through the years very fast. Today, um, the most uh, farmers have, have dairy products, uh, dairy uh, milk and cows and you name it. And um, also they have, they have machines at home to separate the cream from the milk, those, those old machines. Isn't that amazing, living on a farm? My wife doing the job there, yeah. and that's Evelina on her right. She's telling her what to do. It's, it's really amazing. Those machines, I think they got them here from Canada or from the States, and they use them a lot, you know, for their own use at home, the cream, and then they sometimes make butter from that, and it's, it's really good. So that's what they are doing today. Just about every farmer has one of those machines to separate the cream from the milk. This is uh, Loma Plata City Hall. This is where my brother is the city mayor. So here is my brother, and uh, he is leaving tomorrow for the city to have a meeting with the Paraguayan government, I guess, partly. And uh, he doesn't want to speak to me in English, so I will leave him sit there in Spanish. No one will get it. Oh, hi. They are finding out enough for me to be And that's for it. Yeah. He is working here two more months as a city mayor and then he is going into the government and he's one of the, the bodies from the, <coughs> the department of the Paraguay in Chaco. You see, in our area where we lived, we had no rivers. Uh, all the wells were quite salty water, but we could use the water for some other stuff. So one day, the well was maybe 100 meters away from the house. There were a bunch of snakes in there. So dad wanted to shoot him. So he asked me to get a slingshot from home. So I got his slingshot, and while he was working to, uh, preparing to kill the snakes, he said to me, stay away from the well till I got the snakes. So, but I wanted to see how he would kill the snakes. So I went close, really close, with the head first, like the hands there, right beside the well. And just like that, the earth gave way, and my head first deep into the well. Boom, 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 among all those snakes down there. I was so scared, I thought I would be dying in the next couple seconds. The water was deep. So my big father, up, um, up there, he, sent, he threw, a, threw a rope in there. I grabbed the rope, so my, my dad pulled me out of that water very fast.
I love animals. I love them. I grew up with them. We had cats, dogs, pigs, cows, you name it. Lots of birds, lots of wild animals. I grew up with those creatures. They were awesome. I remember one day, my grandpa and my grandma lived across the street. Mom and dad left for the weekend. I guess with horse and buggies, they went far away to do something and left six boys at home. Now, six boys at home alone, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, in Paraguay, they have big frogs. They're really big. They're like, uh, like two kilos, huge frogs. I couldn't find my brother Ronald. He was gone. He was about five years old. Finally, when I found him, he was just right close to the jungle behind a house. He had made a big corral to play. When I came there, he was sitting there and he had a big frog in that corral. For his animals, he put them right in there. So when I came closer, he piped up and said, uh, he said, Edward, I have a frog in here, but don't worry about it. He knew it, I was so scared for them. I was so scared for the frog, just to see those frogs, I would run. So he said, Edward, don't worry about it. I had, I took a nail and a hammer and I nailed the frog on. So when I saw the frog, the frog was just about dead. And I, I just couldn't see the, the animal being tortured like that. And I didn't want to do nothing with it. So I screamed as loud as I could. I said, Grandpa, across the street he lived. I said, Grandpa, could you come and, and look what Ronald did? Grandpa came and saw the frog just about dead. He took care of it, that a poor creature wouldn't suffer anymore. Now the next one to suffer was my brother Ronald. Grandpa took him inside and, uh, and gave him a few slaps on the butt. Now I think they call it kind of a Mennonite spanking. It was just a few slaps on the butt. Grandpa felt so bad what he had done. He gave my brother Ronald 10 bucks for it. 10 bucks for a few slaps on the butt. You know what happened next? All six of us, all five of the rest of the brothers, we were lining up for Grandpa to get a few slaps on the butt to make 10 bucks. Now that was really fun. I will never forget it. Grandpa laughed. He said sorry to my brother. My grandpa never ever did it again. They loved us. When we went there, they gave us many times, I think, their last piece of bread. Awesome. They always prayed for us, told us how to live a good life. I thank God for grandparents. So what was the first job that you had? I worked in a cotton factory, you know, where people brought all the cotton from all the farmers. They usually came with horse and buggies, or wagons, whatever you want to call it, with no seats. Had all the cotton on there, and then they dumped it into this big container, and then it sucked with air somehow into the machine, and, and we had to get the cotton all in there, and, and then later they, they cut the seed out of the cotton, and then they baled it. But this is where we worked. It was, I think, the most horrible job any little child could have. I wasn't very old yet. I don't know exactly the time, but maybe nine, 11, 10, somewhere there. I did part-time, and later I was full-time working there. Why I'm saying it was really bad, just think about the dust when you have a blanket. This is all loose cotton. Um, you know, it was a huge pile of it, like, like, um, thousands and thousands of kilos and then we pushed that around with the fork shoveling it. The dust was flying all over the place. Today my colony has 87 towns. We have our own hospitals, we have our own high schools, elementary schools, we have our own police force, we have our own retirement home, we have absolutely everything a modern civilization could have. We have um, electricity, we have running water in most of the homes. We have beautiful homes, the most of them have air condition, and also they have cars, motorbikes, you name it, including the native people. Our colony today has become rich. Also, we have many of our people from my colony who are missionaries today and bring the gospel to those who never heard it. Also, all over the country of Paraguay, we are supporting other people 
with all kinds of projects to help them out to live a good life. Well, Edward Clausen is going to uh, play a song that really encapsulates that silent night, one of the most beautiful, beautiful hymns at this time of year. Uh, this is his CD uh, full of Christmas melodies. He's playing the Paraguayan harp. In a few minutes, we're going to find out exactly why. He has an amazing story. As I said off the top of the program, you could not write a Hollywood script that is more fascinating or compelling or amazing than his personal story. In a few minutes we're going to hear it, but first here is Edward Clausen playing the Paraguayan harp and Silent Night. <laughs> Edward Clausen now calls Stratford, Ontario home, but you may be surprised to learn he grew up in the jungles of Paraguay. His family lived 500 miles from the nearest city. It wasn't until he was 15 years of age that he saw a paved highway for the first time. What's so remarkable, though, is how someone who grew up in such a secluded and sheltered environment has become a true world traveler, performing all over the globe. You've heard his music, now the story behind the music. Please welcome Edward Clausen once again to 100 Huntley Street. Edward, come and join me. It's a long way from the jungles of Paraguay, South America, to Stratford, Ontario. How did that happen? Well, I, I thank the Lord from the bottom of my heart for touching my heart through mission work. I will never forget uh, when I grew up in a, in a little mud house, actually, when I, when I was still little with my little brothers. Um, it was amazing when one day my lovely dad came home with a beautiful shiny box, mm -hmm. still living in a very poor condition. I remember my dad had brought a beautiful box home with the little, little nubs on the side and he said, children, this box is, is a radio and tonight we'll hear music. 
we couldn't believe it. I will never forget the night sitting beside our little mud house, just the grass roof in 1967. Um, my dad didn't know what he was talking about because I think he never heard a box either before in his life. That night in 1967, when my dad turned a little knob on that radio box, I heard the most beautiful noise a human being can hear on this earth. And then somebody spoke in our own German language. I, I will never forget how we were sitting around it just listening with open mouth, open eyes, open ears. We had hundreds of questions my mom and dad couldn't answer because I think it was the first time for them to hear something like that. And that music and that speaking came to us from a Christian radio station, HCJB World Radio from Quito, Ecuador. And uh, that actually was put seed into our little hearts and that seed never died. In 1980, after 20 years of wondering what was behind those trees, I asked one, my mom and dad one day, I said, Mom and Dad, I'm 20 years old. Would you let me go to that big city to study music? My mom and dad said, absolutely no way. You are staying right here. But I guess mom and dad start praying about it, talking about it. And then one day mom and dad said, if God is calling you, we will not keep you here. You can go with our blessing. In 1980, I left five younger brothers at home, my lovely parents, and, and uh, left the jungle for the big city. Step into, into an old car. It was the most amazing trip of my life. After many days of pushing that car through the Paraguayan swamps, one evening we came up on a hill. The first hill I ever saw in my life. Actually, it was not a mountain at all, just a little hill. I thought it was a huge mountain. At night, we stopped on the top of that hill. On the other side, I saw the capital city down in the valley, a city with 1.2 million people. It was a sea of lights. It was beautiful. It's a picture I will never forget in my life. The next day, we drove into a city with pavement roads, sidewalks, and traffic lights. Somebody brought me to the, to the Paraguay Music Academy. Actually, it was a seminary to study music and also theology. Here I studied for quite a few years. Being there among all those fancy people, I had to learn how to use a toilet. I had to learn how to use a telephone and what a piano was all about. All those years of studying, in 1986, I graduated as a music teacher in a Spanish language. I thought I would go back to the colony and, and, and teach music there, but God sent me from there to Canada and from Canada around the world. Hypocrisy was, for so many years of my life, um, a horrible thing what I did. I just couldn't get rid of it. And one of the things what I did was smoking. I smoked for 20 years hidden. I don't want to judge people who smoke cigarettes. What I want to say is that smoking and, and doing it hidden, lying about it, being just plain a hypocrite, that's where I have the problem with. I remember one day we had this tour, uh, one of my first tours I did in Europe. After a concert, I wanted to go for a walk. Actually, I just want to go for a smoke. And uh, the guy where I lived and where I stayed overnight, he wanted to go with me. I said, just let me go by myself. What I want to do is I want to smoke. So he let me go by myself. 
While I was walking and uh, smoking in Germany, one of the streets, the city I didn't even know, this guy came behind me. So I look back and I see the guy comes right behind me, like, like 20 meters. So I put my cigarette straight in my mouth, burned myself horrible. I had a bunch of gum with me, put that in my mouth. By this time, he was right beside me. I had perfume with me and I hid the whole thing. I don't know till today if he saw it, if he smelled it or not. Obviously, he must have smelled it. I flew back from that trip to Canada, 1990, November 27 at 12.30. I was so scared that I would die one day and land in hell. I thought to myself, man alive, I have to straighten out my life. I'm 30 years old and I have this sin, not just a cigarette, it was all kinds of stuff. I kneeled down beside my bed. I opened the Bible up at John 3.16 and started to cry, beg, and confess my sins. After two hours, maybe the toughest hours of my life, Jesus Christ, my Lord, came that day into my heart. He took the sin away and made me a child of His. That day I became a child of God, the best moment of my life. I will never forget it, 1990, November 27, at 12.30, where Jesus Christ became the Lord of my life. Since then, the Lord has opened doors for me and sent me around the world. 26 years of full-time ministry, it couldn't have gone better. God has opened doors beyond anything I had ever imagined. And this started all in the jungles of South America, through mission work, through the Bible we read, and how God changed me finally. you have had the opportunity to travel all over the globe with your music and sharing your personal story of what God has done in your life. But you also had an opportunity to meet somebody very special. I'll let you tell the rest of the story because you mentioned that yes. you will never forget <laughs> J.D. Friesen. Yes. Uh, a year and a half ago or so, we traveled with Transworld Radio out west. And I have been many times west. In the city of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in the middle of the concert, I saw a gentleman sitting there with tears in his eyes. I gave my testimony, the same concert I usually do. This old gentleman came up on stage, and guess what he said to me? He said to me, Edward, my name is J.D. Friesen. I am so impressed what I have heard tonight. I said, why do you say that? Well, he said, I am one of the missionaries who came in the late 70s and early 80s to your mud house in a Paraguayan bush, and we had evangelistic evenings. He said, Brother Clausen, I had never dreamt in my life that I would see a result like this here in my home city, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Because he didn't really know. I, I mean, they held a number of meetings, and, but you never know if, if the word is going to be received or the difference that you've made right. after you pack up and go back to Canada. Exactly. Wow, it's amazing how that story came around full circle. After you graduated from the Music Academy, how did you decide that the harp was going to be your 
passion in life. I really never thought that would be my passion. I, I didn't expect that one day I would travel with music. There was a guy in Germany just before I graduated from the, from, from the school. He, he asked me if I could uh, maybe come one day to Europe and, and do a tour with him. I did. When I came back from that tour in Europe, I knew that God had something in store for me beyond anything maybe I had ever imagined. And exactly that's what happened. I went to Canada, moved to Canada in 1986, started playing here and there in some churches in the city of Winnipeg. People invited me to come and play uh, different settings like banquets and fundraisers and you name it, mostly in German Spanish churches at that time. But then, then people got, got to know me, I guess, and, and more people invited me, and it became, became a ministry. May God bless you. You know, soon you and I will stand in a beautiful heaven. On golden streets we will walk, and there we will see what, it, what an impact something like this has. There are so many people who need the Lord among our plot teacher man. She does that look very fail about the Lord group in them. I live as a faint design that he here hand for me, but we cannot on lane on an onda. He don't attain the goal or pay the funds in God. It's a wonderful privilege. I hope that you don't mind having some beautiful music. Never had I thought it would come out this way. Traveling um, really just all over the world in many different provinces, or just about all of the provinces in Canada, in the States, Central America, South America, Europe, and also New Zealand and Australia. Here we are in a beautiful jungle of New Zealand. Just imagine being beside a tree like this. Look at behind me, a tree 800 years old. This is just the most amazing place I think we have ever seen. My family here in the jungle together with our friends, praise the Lord. Many years ago, when I still lived at home, in 1975, somewhere there, my mom and dad had enough money one day, I guess. They bought us children an old rotten Paraguayan folk harp, something like this. The harp which my mom and dad had bought had just a few strings on them. The rest of them, my brothers and I one day, tied up with the fish line. And at that time, some fancy missionaries had showed up from the north, I guess from Canada, from the United States. These amazing people who call themselves missionaries, they brought us a beautiful song, which we called a super modern contemporary rock and roll song. The title, The Little Brown Church in the Wildwood. A beautiful hymn. I remember that night in 1975, sitting beside a little mud house beside a bonfire, I learned to play my first song. I will never forget it, the beautiful sound coming out of that box. I was so amazed. Never in my life had I dreamt at that time that one day I would travel around the world and share my story how I learned to play my first song. Away from the modern civilization, in the deep jungles of South America, I dreamt about maybe one day I would have the chance to play more music. Here I am, traveling around the world for 26 years full time. I think that's just absolutely amazing. I thank the Lord for those amazing people who left their homes behind in this country, who left their families behind and came to us poor people and brought us music, they brought us hope. They also encouraged all of us that we should study preparing our lives to serve God, our Lord, our Father in heaven. And that's exactly what I'm doing. With God's grace now, traveling and seeing all kinds of stuff and playing beautiful music.
it is really soothing. We are here right now in my, my home studio, uh, right now sitting here. And when I sit here and, and just practice my music by myself, this is really quiet in here. As you can see, the walls around here are thick, very thick, like, like two feet thick around. You don't hear nothing from the outside world. Sitting here, have the closed doors, and just sitting and playing the harp, the sound, by myself. I can do it for hours. It feels so good. It just like soaks it into my heart. Uh, hearing, the, hearing the natural music coming out of a box and from a string. I didn't even know where the middle C was on the piano when I came to the music academy. All that I had to learn. Yes, I studied music, all the theory and all that. The, the harp, all those years I lived in a city, was my hobby instrument. And it was taught to me from one of Paraguay's best harpists. He taught me how to play the native music. That guy didn't even know a note. He had made 12 of his own records. I studied classic music, all the theory and all that stuff too. My harp teacher couldn't even read a note. My dad bought us a harp when I was 17 years old. My dad and my mom must have gotten one day, I guess, enough money. They bought us an old harp like this, something like it. It had only a few strings on them. The rest, my brothers and I tied up with the fish line. The missionaries had just come from Canada at the time and brought us a, brought us a super modern, contemporary rock and roll song. Now that's what we called it. It was a song called The Little Brown Church in the Wildwood, an old church hymn. Sitting beside a bonfire in that beautiful jungle, I learned to play my first song. Never in my life had I dreamt that one day I would travel around the world and sharing that story. I love the old hymns because there are lots of wonderful words. Like if I play Amazing Grace, I think about the story when John Newton wrote the song. You know, he was a guy who sold his slaves to, to, the, to the United States. And one day that guy was in the middle of the ocean and a big storm came. He had a ship packed full of slaves and he was so scared they would all die. He committed his life to the Lord and said, when I'm back now to the States, I will never sell slaves anymore. And he went later back to England and wrote the song Amazing Grace. Those words which are behind those songs really touched my heart. And I love the melodies too. It's suiting for the harp because this harp has only a diatonic scale. If I would tune this harp to the key, to the key of C on the piano, I would have only the white ones. All the black ones are missing. So I have no sharps, no flats except if I tune it to a key like that. Um, so the, the sound is really unique though. No other harp in the world sounds like the Paraguayan jungle harp. For me, it's so soothing. And so many other people like it too. And I thank the Lord for the support I get from people all over the world, that they love to hear the story and also the music.
This is where we do all of our recordings, uh, the harp tracks at least. Here we sit many hours and have a great time. Nice and quiet, it's, uh, it's a professional uh, home studio. Um, obviously with the computers I record all, all the songs here on the harp and then I upload it to the internet and send it straight to Nashville or to Toronto, wherever the studios are. The most of our recordings are done at uh, Omnisun Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. So I upload it on our server here, right from the studio. And then they download it at the other end and uh, put the rest of the instruments on it. Put all the nice reverbs, compression and all that stuff, that fancy stuff onto it. And then they send the master to me here in, in Stratford, Ontario. And then we send it to the duplication companies and they uh, send us the finished product. And from there to the homes, wherever, um, whoever likes Paraguayan harp music. And I thank God for, for having a nice studio, a nice family here that we can do something like this and make a joyful noise for the Lord. It's just amazing the changes I, I went through. You know, when I heard the first time a radio, like I said already in this story, when I heard the first radio many moons ago, I was so amazed about this little thing. How would I have ever dreamt that one day I would sit in a studio like this with all the computer and software stuff, putting those things together? I think for me, the, the, the modern technolo technology has helped me a lot to put things together, to make a joyful noise. And there are so many wonderful things about it that I can use to make, to make the things better. So uh, yeah, I have the iPad and I have the iPod Touch. Actually, I have the, the iPod Touch on stage, on a harp. When you see me play, push the buttons there and it plays right just like that. It's a super stereo. I can have two and a half thousand songs on there. Wow, as a background music. And also I have, a, I have this computer here and all the microphones and all the harps. And inside the harp, a nice microphone that I can um, put it through a sound system. Years ago, we didn't have microphones. I didn't even know what the microphone was all about. Today, when you have a bigger audience, you obviously need all that. So it's amazing. It has been a roller coaster ride from the beginnings of the jungles to the super modern stage. What a change. Uh, it's just amazing for me to, to be in a place like this and, and make, a, make, make a CD. Uh, I still remember the first one I did many, many moons ago. Um, it took, I think that cost me 10 bucks for my first recording. And, and that was done in Paraguay. Yeah, I thought I had done a great job on that. So we sold 100 copies of my first recording. And I thought, I thought I, I was so famous. I had sold 100, 100 cassettes. And I thought that would be maybe my last recording I would ever do in my life. And since then, I guess I have made another 26 of the recordings. And I have, in the meantime, done uh, two DVDs and also uh, a book from my life story. When I came to the city, uh, first of all, to study music, that's when I started the first recording. And from there, I went uh, to Canada and did my first uh, recording here. And then I thought, hey, this goes really well. Maybe I should do this full time. So God had it all lined up for me that I would start somehow uh, very humble and I want to keep it humble. I don't want to change that part. So it went very, very slow. One, one CD after another sold uh, many of them all over the world. And that actually has kept me on a road because in all those 26 uh, years of full time traveling, I have never ever charged for one single of my concerts. It's always free will offering base or honorarium. And also I sell my, my CDs and book in DVDs. It's lots of people, like 50 plus people usually, they listen to the old hymns, in, which I love to play, which are my favorite. They tell me sometimes after the concert, this is the best concert I have ever heard in my life. If somebody like that tells me that they have heard the best concert in their life, with their age, uh, I, I think sometimes, my goodness, it can't be that good. I am not doing something good like that. It's God blessing the concerts in that way. And, I, and I, I really appreciate that people are telling me that they like it and what they would like different. So that's why I have always kept doing the same kind of the same idea. 
because people are blessed by it. And if they're blessed, I am blessed too. I am doing the will of God that I can bless other people with it. Our children helped me always uh, setting up the sound system. Uh, Matthias, the oldest one, is doing that. And Sheldon is helping always with uh, selling the CDs and the products after the concert. Yes, they always have helped me and they really like it. They have been raised on a, on a road. They have been in a couple thousand of programs, I guess. So they know already how it goes. While this DVD, I hope it will be a blessing to people too. And from here, um, I don't know. Um, Full-time traveling, again, we have lots of concerts booked up uh, all over the world and uh, I can't wait to see the rest of the world. So tell me, how did you end up coming to Canada? How did they even allow you citizenship? Well, just that you know, my, my great-grandparents and my grandparents were Canadians. So when I, was, when I was in the city to study music, there came a law out in Canada that all the people, those, those younger folks who were born before their mom was 24 years old, if your grandparents were Canadians, you could make automatically Canadian citizenship. So a fellow in the city, he asked me one day who had a travel agency. He became my friend. He said, so Edward, aren't your grandparents Canadian citizen? I said, yes. How about your great grandparents? I said, they are Canadians too. He said, Edward, you, you can make Canadian citizenship. I said, what's that? He said, never mind, would you like to do that? That one day that if you want to move to Canada, you can, you can do that. I said, sure. He said, it doesn't cost you much. So I filled out the papers. A Couple of months later, I had my, my, um, my Canadian citizenship, whatever, that, that little paper. And then later I made a passport and had it right there. When I came back from Germany, I knew that I would move to Canada and, and do something with my harp. That's how I made it out of the jungle into Canada. In 1986, I left Paraguay with 42 Celsius and flew to the frozen north. I landed in the city of Winterpack, Manitoba. Excuse me, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And there I lived for six years. Here in this city, I, I started off with the ministry to travel with my harp. Thank you, brothers and sisters for supporting mission work. That's how it works. The Lord makes Christians with us. He is using all of us. We are all an open letter for our Savior. I want to encourage all of us tonight. Rejoice in the Lord. It's about Jesus, not about the church building. It's not about denomination. It's not about HCJB. It's about Jesus serving Him in whichever way we can. Why don't you tell me this story how you and I met. Sure, I'd love to tell that story. A friend of mine invited me to go and see you and Gustav play at a church. Gustav plays the guitar and of course you playing the harp. And I really didn't want to go because I just finished a long day at work, but then I decided I would. And I was very grateful I did. I enjoyed it immensely. And then my friend, being the bold person that she is, invited me and also you and Gustav to her place for a meal a couple of days later. And I went and you and Gustav were supposed to be making the meal. And you ended up in the kitchen cooking and so did I. I was just happened to be standing around in the kitchen and just talking about life and what my plans were and what your plans were and, and uh, you thought, wow, this is, that I was an interesting person and that you told me this later though, thankfully, that you knew I was the person you were going to marry. But I'm glad you didn't tell me right then at that moment because I probably would have ran out the door. Anyway, we did have some communication over the next couple of months and then I had gone out to Bible school about seven months later out in Manitoba and that's where we got to know each other and started dating and we were married a year later. What connections have you kept from the past? Actually I have kept quite a bit of connections with some of the organizations, especially the one with HCJB. HCJB Radio is the one 
I heard when I was seven years old, like I told a story already, in the jungles of South America, now I have an opportunity to be part of the same ministry, doing fundraisers for them in Canada, have done it here many, many times, and also I had the privilege, or we had the privilege, to go all the way to New Zealand in Australia and do 40 concerts for them, fundraiser for the radio station to beam the gospel to those who maybe never heard even music, the same as I did many months ago. Now I thank the Lord for the opportunity I have to be part of the ministry, to share with others how God can use our gifts to praise His name. God has given all of us wonderful gifts to praise His name. I had never dreamt in my life that one day I would be in a sun, sunny coast, Australia, harping around for fancy people like you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight to a beautiful church. I think this is our, our 40th program on this tour, and this church is, I think, among our 10 best we have seen in New Zealand and Australia. This is a beautiful place. Wow. Now tonight, I am in big trouble. You saw what I did there, right? <laughs> I left my shoes about an hour south from here. <laughs> I asked my children to put them in a van. <laughs> they didn't do it. <laughs> we were eating supper here today, and I said to my children, did you put their shoes in a the van? They said, no. I, said, my, I asked my wife, did you put the shoes in there? She said, no. I said, then they must be not there. She said, no. <laughs> This is the first time in 24 years of full-time traveling around the world that I am playing a concert with a tuxedo. <laughs> and for runners. And for that matter, they're white. <laughs> I will have lots of jokes about it tonight, I guess. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming and supporting the Christian ministry. I hope that the Holy Spirit will encourage all of us tonight to rejoice in our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. There would be no rock and roll music for me tonight, but I promise you it will be a rock and harpin. How about that? <laughs> and I will do the Spanish Baptist style. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor, for opening your church that we could come here. It is awesome to be in the house of the Lord among wonderful people like this who have maybe supported mission work all your life. If you want to see a result of it, just look at me. I am the least here tonight who deserves it, standing on a super modern stage with a smile on my face, talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. I want the people, when they see this DVD, when, when they sit in that nice seat there and watching somebody who grew up in the jungle, that they will see that the grace of God came to one of the poorest in this world. I just want to let the people know that I am the least who deserves it, that I can tell a story like this, how the Lord came through missionaries, other people who came to that beautiful jungle and encouraged us young people, older people, children, that we should love the Lord, that we had a wonderful gift from God, that we should use it before we die. I want that people will see that God had mercy on one of the poorest and gave me and my family and many other ones the chance today that we can witness for God all over the world. I also want to tell people and encourage people to support mission work. So many of the people who are, who are supporting mission work and also helping the poor in this world, they might never see a result of it. I want that they see through this DVD that those people who have supported mission work, that God is still changing people all over the world. If that's in China, Africa, or you name it, wherever it is in the world, people who receive um, help from the North, good encouragement, God is changing people. That's the point I want to make through the whole DVD. And I hope that the people will see it that way too. There are still many people who live the same as I did many moons ago. There are still so many people who need help. I want that the Holy Spirit will touch those people who are out there who never had a hope yet, that we all work together as one family. Doesn't matter which church denom denomination we have, it's about Jesus Christ our Lord. And Him we want to serve 
in him we want to also give the honor and glory for it. I hope you enjoyed the story behind my music. How I grew up in the jungles of South America. I hope it was a real blessing to you. I hope also that was an encouragement to you to walk with the Lord and use all of our gifts which we have from God to serve Him with all our hearts.